This is the OTP presented by Farm Bureau Health Plans. When it's crunch time for your health coverage, trust Farm Bureau Health Plans to implement the perfect game plan. With over 77 years protecting Tennesseans, Farm Bureau Health Plans knows how to win. Time for the OTP 4D. Amy Wells, Rhett Bryan, Mike Keith, glad to have you after preseason game number two, a 16-15 to Titans win over Seattle. We have four separate questions, which we just so creatively call four downs. It makes sense, though. It does make sense. Don't sell yourself short, Mike. It, do, it does make sense. Uh, so question number one, which is first down, your player of the game, Amy Wells won the draw, and so she gets to name her player of the game first. Uh, my player of the game is Nick Westbrook Akine. Okay. Mm -hmm. Not only did he have the only touchdown of the game, but he also just continues to be a consistent player on this team. No matter what, when his number is called, he makes a play. This is just what happens. He is reliable. He is consistent. He was my player of the game and will probably be my player of the game again at some point this year. He just does those things. He's just he's, always there. He's got a Matthew Slater-esque quality that whatever he's asked to do, he does. And I, I think the key to any football team in the NFL and their success is you have to have great players, and your great players have to play up to their salaries. If you're playing, if you're paying somebody fifteen million dollars a year, they've got to play up to that level. That's the key. But the second key is that you have to have reliable guys at other spots who just fill roles at different times, and every game that player will make a play. Maybe in special teams, maybe in his in Nick's case, blocking on a running play that goes a long way, catching a big first down pass, scoring a touchdown, whatever. And Nick is just a winning football player. And every time he's sort of written off, he just continues to come back. I, I'm a fan. Yeah, I mean, he's he's someone who kind of gets lost in the like big name shuffle somehow because you've got the bright lights of the DeAndre Hopkins and the Calvin sure. Ridley and woohoo. And yes, those people are very exciting. But he is just a guy who always is there no matter what, doing his job. And he's going to be part of your 48 on game day. 100%. Because of what he gives you in special teams and the fact that he can play multiple spots in the receiving core. Nobody has ever said that he is a DeAndre Hopkins or a Calvin Ridley. But we don't need him to be. No, but at times I think because the receiving core has been less than spectacular, it's as if he was being put forward as the number one or number two option. And I don't think that's ever what he was meant to do. I think what he's being asked to do in this receiving core is is Rhett what he can and I think will do well. But because that the wide receiving core has been less than spectacular up until recent things roster-wise, he was able to make big plays in right. places and mm -hmm. get the valuable reps when he was cutting his teeth coming into this thing. And I think that's what has paid off dividends in this. A big fan of Nick Westbrook Akine just because of what you've outlined. I mean, he, you call his number and he's there. Mm -hmm. All right, first down for Rhett Bryan, your player of the game from the Titans, 16-15, to 15, went over Seattle. It's Jaquan Jackson. Jaquan Jackson, leading receiver in that game, four, four catches, 57 yards. Two of those were explosive plays, two of the longest plays on offense of the night, and one of them on second and 17 for Malik Willis. So a, a guy that just keeps showing up on the film, showing up in the places where he needs to, doesn't seem like the moment's too big for him. Really like Jaquan Jackson. He just keeps solidifying himself day by day. Yes. Uh, my player of the game is from defense. I'm going to go Jalen Harrell. Mm -hmm. um, wow. I, I mean, this young man continues to show up in a big way at a position where the Titans lack depth. They need somebody to come through, and he's coming through. Brian Callahan in his Sunday press conference saying very clearly – that he's got a rotational role at this moment. And I think that the news or lack of news, whatever you want to call it, about Arden Key, uh, let's just say Arden Key being available, helps Jalen Harold as well because now with Key available, with Harold Landry, 
Jalen Harrell is able to stay in the role that he was meant to have as a rookie, which is a rotational player. Not too much expected of him, but enough expected of him to be able to utilize the talent where he can continue to grow into it. I don't think it's a stretch to say that Jalen Harold can help the 2024 Tennessee Titans based on what we've seen out of him, Red. I believe the same thing. Um, I mean, look, he, he comes from a college program that, you know, they won the national championship. They had 18 guys in the draft process. And for every big star they had on that team, they had a Jalen Harrell there that without a doubt, without those guys – probably wouldn't have won the national championship. Sure. I mean, he's just that kind of guy. He's very unassuming, uh, very kind of keeps to himself because uh, he's somebody you're going to hear on Titans radio in, in Titans countdown this coming week um, in New Orleans. Uh, enjoyed talking to him because he's just one of those. He's You can tell he's taking in the moment and, and learning and learning on the fly, but because of what's asked of him, to your point, it's able to play into his strengths. Boy, he came out of a big program in high school. He went to high school with with uh, Nicholas Petit Frere at uh, Berkeley in Tampa, and then he goes to Michigan. You know, his dad played at Florida. His dad's a high school coach. So, Amy, I, I, lo- I love these guys that have come out of big high school programs and big college programs because there has been a level of expectation. They may or may not make it because of talent, yes, but they rarely don't make it because they freak out under the lights. Right, at 100%. Guys who are familiar with being on a big stage from an early age within their football careers generally adapt to what this is better because Michigan will train you to play at the NFL level. A big high school will train you to play at Michigan. So nothing ever seems too big. Now, there, are, there of course, are finding your, your, your place within a team, finding your place within a program, all of that stuff. It's not saying if you go to a big school, you are guaranteed to play in the National Football League because there's a lot of other things sure. that have to happen in between that. But there's some of those intangibles that definitely exist for guys who have come from those bigger programs because they just get it. They understand how this works. And having a dad who's a football coach, you also just get some of the business side of things you get the decision making a little bit more well and you you've been coached Mm -hmm. you understand how to practice and the other thing too red is you understand expectations yeah i mean you go to michigan all they talk about is beating ohio state Mm -hmm. they want to win the national championship but that's job one well they they want to win the national championship they want to win the big 10 but if you go to ohio state or michigan you want to beat the other one one job and and that's what it is I mean, that's what it comes down to. And if you don't do that, the year is not a success. And anybody who has had that mindset at any point, I think, understands the job of being an NFL player. After talking to um, Hassan Haskins after a training camp practice a few days ago, we brought him up. We brought up Jalen. He goes, oh, gosh. He said, listen, you know, our paths didn't cross for super long because of the age difference and, you know, time there at the program. He said he was special from day one, just kind of seeing how he went at the job in, in, in itself. And he said, I, he said, that's been my dog from day one. He said, I, you know, so glad he's here. And I think, I, to your point, he said, I think he can help us. Wonder if he's Carlos Hall. That would be uh, lovely. Yeah. Carlos Hall, seventh, seventh round pick. Out of Arkansas in 2003, ended up being a pretty special player for the Tennessee Titans as a seventh round pick. Well, there Had you go. Three or three and a half sacks in a ball game? Three sacks in his first game he ever played against Philadelphia when Javon Curse broke his foot. I love it when people just play out of their minds, like rise to the occasion. Javon Curse had a Jones fracture in his right foot. But, and you know, but, you know, Carlos turned out to be a good player overall. He did. He was not a spectacular player, and maybe Jalen can be better than that. But, um, you know, would you take that out of a seventh-round player? I was going to say, yeah. again, for a seventh-round selection, you're winning. All right, second down. Top thing that stood out to you, Amy? Uh, Braden Narvison and his 59-yard field goal that – 
I mean, I've seen probably 80 times since it happened. It's just fun to watch it over and over again. And it, here's the thing. I mean, it, it was a, a, a great kick. I mean, he had plenty of leg behind that thing. It was definitely going to be there. Um, so it showed off, like, his abilities and his strength and all of that, which is very exciting. Now, do we think that this solidifies him on the football team? His future is no. I mean, we don't know what they're going to end up doing at that position. We probably have a pretty good idea. I mean, Coach well, I Callahan talked Nick about Folk. it, yeah, that Nick Folk is going to be the guy. But, I mean, we don't know what this means for him in other places and what he's able to do. But it was a great showing by him. It was great for our fans got really excited uh-huh. about it. Like, the stadium was really into that moment, which in the fourth quarter of a second preseason game, you know, always see people getting really excited about something. So that was an exciting moment just to generate some energy there. And man, I mean, he looked pretty doing it. And then he ends the game with the walk-off field goal. The guy had a great day and it was just exciting to watch. The question now with him is if Folk does go on to be the kicker, which, I mean, Brian Callahan has given every indication that that is his inclination. Yeah. Do you try to keep Narvison on the practice squad? Do you keep a kicker as one of your 16 practice squad players? A, I would try, and B, good luck, because I, I think somebody might just well, try to grab it, him. But everybody's let me, seen what he can do now. But let me slightly disagree with the two of you. Most people have, in terms of NFL GMs and coaches, most of them have almost an allergy towards having a young kicker. Yeah. Unless it's somebody you've drafted, like Jake Moody with San Francisco, who, you know, if he did the extra point in the Super Bowl. Well, but the I point, mean, we don't. But the point <laughs> is, most people, I mean, Evan McPherson in Cincinnati is a different story. You know, there, there's some, but most people would rather have a guy who's done it. Yeah. So I think it's possible if you, if you cut him that – Somebody will not claim him, and that you could bring him back. And and with a kicker who's going to be forty later in the season, would it be a bad idea? In cooler weather games and a K ball and all that. Well, kind of because stuff. you could also call him up at some point. Yeah, you know, you would have the the practice squad call ups if you needed him. If if something like if Folk was going to be down for a week or two, you would you know you would have the ability to do that. It's not a bad idea. Uh, well, I mean, again, I'm not saying you're wrong. I, I think it's completely feasible that somebody could say, yes, we want him to be our first string kicker. That's totally possible. But the the bigger question is, do you want to allocate one of those 16 spots to a special teams player? Yeah, and that's that's where all this roster math is going to get real well, interesting. Well, because now my focus – Everybody's doing their 53, and that's great, and, and it's fun. But I think you start to look at who the 16 can be, how many of the 16 practice squad guys you have on your current 90-man roster. I don't know the answer to that right now. It's, I, I think you've probably got a goodly number. Yeah. I don't think you're going to go out and sign 10 from another place. No. No, I'd say you got – it's just just a guess, but I say I say half of them you've got. Oh, maybe you know, I was going to say ten. Last year I thought I think it ended up being thirteen at mm-hmm. the start of the year. Yep. I was going to say ten. All right, Rep. Brian, second down. The thing that stood out to you, the way this offense with Brian Callahan, even though it's a preseason game and it's one game, the way that you're starting to look at the numbers and the situations differently. And what I'm leading to is, you know, we get the game books afterwards. And I looked at the ten, 10 longest plays for the Titans on offense. 15 yards was the minimum. That was the threshold. I don't know when you can go back and look at a Titans stat game book where the top 10 plays, the, the shortest one was 15 yards. That's a good one. Because in recent history, I don't think that's a thing. And just because of the run game part of it and you know situations like that, but I mean, now, three of those top ten plays were explosive plays of 20 or more. But that's that's chunks, man. That's chunks. The top thing that stood out to me was Colt Anderson's influence. Brian Callahan was going to punt mm-hmm. with 
the Titans trailing 12 to 10. And Colt Anderson, the special teams coordinator, the new special teams coordinator, immediately said to him, Narvison can make this field goal. Let's kick it. Had he missed, Seattle would have gotten the ball at their own 49 yard line. I mean, it's a risk. And I, I think we're starting to see through some of the different things that we're looking at in terms of personnel, return strategy, how the kickers are being sent out there, what they're looking to do, what their punt strategy is going to be. And we'll see more of that as as Stonehouse works his way back in. I think Colt Anderson, the special teams coach, has a big say-so uh, with this head coach in terms of how they plot that third phase more strategically. Am I crazy? No, you're not because – Brian Callahan told you that in, on Titans Radio post game. It's like, hey, no, here's here's what happened. We were going to trot them guys, you know, and then Cole said, no, no, he can kick Let's it. Let's kick it. Let's well, do it. It's an interesting time to be a special teams coordinator, especially a new special teams coordinator. Right. Because of the change in the rules, especially when it comes to kickoff and all of that stuff. Um, it, it gives you – a real different opportunity to utilize a whole phase of the game in a completely different way. That's right. And so all of this sudden, you you have to be a, a kind of an outside the box thinker in a lot of different things. And I wonder if Brian Callahan is seeing that, and I mean, trust his judgment on a lot of things I think because that, he's needing to scheme up a lot of. I think things. that's true, Amy. And I think the other part of it too that's going to be fascinating to see is Colt Anderson's influence in what the fifty-three ends up looking like. Because if you have a particularly good special teams player, like say Hassan Haskins, who's a really, really good special teams player. Well, maybe you don't need a fourth running back on the roster. But is his son Haskins going to help you more on game day than an extra defensive lineman or an extra linebacker or whatever? So, you know, you've got those core four guys that they talk about. And will there be certain guys kept on the 53 regardless of position because they're going to play every special teams unit and play it well and and potentially be a difference maker over somebody who is probably not going to have a role and how much how much is that worked into the to the math of all of it because there there are certain spots you say well it does not make sense to keep a fourth running back yeah i mean but what if the fourth running back is your number one special teams player. Yeah. Then you have to – Yeah, the numbers aren't carved out just by their specific name right. position. Right. And I, I just yeah. use Haskins as an example because he does play mm -hmm. teams really, really well, and normally that's a position where you don't keep – you don't keep running backs around to make them inactive on game day. That's not generally a spot where you do it. No. I mean, no. every, every running back is – the thought is, without, without injury, every running back will be up. Yeah. Um, so if you keep an extra one, to me it's because the special teams coach said, we have to have this guy. Yeah. So the Colt Anderson influence to be watched. Right now we say, hey, Titans fans, Seat Geek makes it easy to find tickets so you can be part of all the touchdown celebrations. Whether you're buying or selling football tickets – SeatGeek is the place to do it. SeatGeek, the official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans. The most disruptive idea in ticketing, a ticket that works. Expect the expected. SeatGeek! Figured I'd let her do it, Red. After I think she that was I kind of thought that's where that was going that was, yeah, based on last week. That's a pretty good idea. Yeah. you just continually fall flat on that one. All right, third down. <laughs> what surprised you from the Titans' 16-15 to win over Seattle? The penalties, the penalties, mainly the penalties by the offensive line. I say mainly them. I don't try to call people out, but they had, what, nine of the ten? No, they didn't so, have nine. They had eight or nine. Well, no. Something it, like that. They it was had, pretty high. It was, they had a lot of them. Yeah. There were some on special teams. Yeah, there were some on special teams, but they had a fair amount. Yeah, it wasn't great. It, it, it was, was high. It was not great, Bob. It was high. Yeah, it was not great. Um, and 
I think that is something that was, A, unexpected coming off of the team's first preseason game. Right. And that's what made it stick out to me. You go into every preseason game expecting a lot of penalties because players are figuring out some of the nuances. That's true. Officials are... Calling everything. Are calling everything because they're <laughs> trying to get in the rhythm. There's points of emphasis that everybody's trying to figure out. You expect a lot because everybody's trying to work out the kinks before we get to the regular season. So when in week one of the Titans preseason there weren't that many penalties, especially on the well, there were none line. in the first half at all. Right. And so you think, oh, okay, this is interesting. Well, how buttoned up? And then in the second preseason game, it, it was a lot different. Do you not think that some of that is due to the fact that the first team played a good bit of the first half in the first preseason game yep. and the first team did not take part in the second preseason game? 100%. And I wrote that down as some of my little side things that might have influenced it. So a couple of the things. The second and third team were the guys that were playing for the entirety of the game against the Seattle Seahawks. So there's that. Different officiating crew, of course. So that's going to be a little bit different. There were definitely things that were different. Um, however, I would expect that this week there will be an emphasis on fundamentals. Hmm. And there will be an emphasis on not making mental mistakes. False starts. I think, I think I would wager that Bill Callahan noticed that <laughs> and did not enjoy that and will probably be making sure that it doesn't happen in New Orleans. You're right, though, with the layers of considering different person. I mean, because think about it. Malik worked with the twos. Right. He doesn't work with the twos as much. As Mason. It, right. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, when you start thinking of the layers that There's way. I'm not saying that they wonder, are bad. I always wonder, too, when you have different quarterbacks with units that they don't work with all the time, if the unit itself is not used to the quarterback's cadence. That, uh, that's 100%. what I'm driving at. Yes. Yeah. No, I, I don't think they're bad at their jobs. But I do but think. But sometimes I think when guys jump, it's not all their fault. I'm sure. But I think that if there are mental Sometimes mistakes, I think, to I think be it's fixed, quarterback's fault. No, that's that's exactly what I'm driving at. With the point is that because Malik is was working with the twos, not only are they not used to working to each other, they're not used to his cadence. They're used to the bark of Mason Rudolph right. in this case. So yeah, I mean, there's there's a multitude of things that have kind of led to Can what contribute. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I'm not saying it's all Malik's fault or Mason's no, fault. It's no, not. I'm it's not. I'm just saying that that can sometimes it's a combination of things. It's a but, collective that needs to be fixed. But interesting that Callahan said the starters are going to get some serious work Sunday in New Orleans. Interesting, right? Back to that point, I I was not expecting that, Red. I wasn't either. Um, I, I wonder if any of the percentage of his decision for that has to do with that it will be indoors. It will not be in the blazing sun or what, you know, in terms of, you know, soft tissue things and things like that injury wise. I, I mean, I know that's like a way out there kind of thought for a second, but those things factor in at some point. I mean, you're going to be outside and played in hot weather. And, you, know. I, you know, and I think some of it too is he knows that they've, They've got to be ready for Chicago, mm -hmm. and knocking off as much of the new as they possibly can is is a big factor. Rhett, what surprised you in Saturday night's preseason game? It was the the kick by Braden Narvison, <laughs> really, honestly, because doing it in college or doing it in practice here at Ascension St. Thomas Sports Park, that's one thing. But then also finding out later that he was very ill on game day He'd and didn't sick. know if he was going to you know, play, and then – that 59-yarder, Mike, I think it would have been good from 65-plus because when you watch how it pinged the net that catches those, I mean, it wasn't these where it just kind of alley-oop over the old crossbar. It went with authority. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know what? Dude's got a leg. Mm -hmm. I mean, because he, he hit it right. Had some mustard on it. That surprised me a little bit. It did have some mustard on it. <laughs> well, the other thing, you know, talking about how – GMs and coaches have allergies towards young kickers, aversions to young kickers. And he's not that young. He kicked six years in college. I was going to say, he went to three different programs. Right. Well, very, yeah. I, I, I mean, mean, he started in 2018 at Iowa State, and then he was at Western Kentucky for three years. 
is it an aversion to young or aversion to new? It's because aversion, those are two different it's things. It's aversion to inexperience. Your point is yeah. well taken. Yeah. Uh, what surprised me and what continues to surprise me, but it shouldn't, but I, I'm just going to admit this, is just the way Julius Chestnut is a pro. I mean, he just continues to develop in that Nick Westbrook Akine way. And here was Julius at a sacred heart. And he was one of the stories of training camp a couple of years ago. And then last year, got off to a great start. We had him wired at Minnesota uh, for the preseason game. And he played a great game and he continued to develop. And then he had a pretty significant injury and, and was put on IR. And then he's come back. And, you know, what we saw from him is when they were running the drills in the off season during the, the OTAs, he's leading the drills. He's, you know, because Tony Pollard's new and Tajay defers a little to him because he's, a, he's sort of a big brother type. And then he goes out and he runs the football well and he, he's involved in pass protection and he's involved in special teams and he catches the ball and does things. And you just think back to, you know, Two years ago, and he was this guy out of a program, that a quality program of its size, but, but Sacred Heart's just not very big, and it's the opposite of Jay, Jalen Harold playing at Michigan, and yet Julius just keeps doing it, and you're, you're, you're like, wow. I mean, he's, he has developed into this total pro, and I don't know what the future holds for him, but when you watch him play in the preseason, you are continually impressed with number 36, Julius Chestnut. Julius, first of all, is a solid dude. Done some community events with him. He's great with the kids and, you know, the messages about, you know, doing the right things. Um, and the other part, to your point, is the significant injury that, that wiped out the chunk of his season. Mm -hmm. I, I have no idea what that's like for a player and, and where they would go into the recesses of their mind and trying to get back and all those things that, you know, the hurdles to get back to it. He seems like he's better for it. Like, he, he just – I don't know, man. But, yeah, you you need guys like him. Um, Yeah, I'm impressed with him too. He just – I don't know. Can I share a quick story? Please. Okay, so – we did this off-season feature with Will Levis where we went to the golf course with him. Mm -hmm. And we want to go to golf course, and you're going to see this. Is it on the first Titans All Access? I believe so. I think it May is. Yeah. The yeah. first Titans All Access airs the weekend of the Chicago game. So September, the weekend of September 6, 7, 8. So we, we went out. And we did this feature with Will. Will was great. And we talked about all sorts of things. We wanted to get in a position where we weren't in a studio. We weren't, you know, out somewhere doing an interview. We were riding around in a golf cart. And we just talked. And then we came back and we put the whole thing together. We think it's pretty good. We'll see. But the group that Will chose, which is really fascinating to go play golf, is we, we let him pick his, his foursome. And it's a buddy of his, Mac Herford, who's a good dude. But then teammates, Latavius Simmons, Rashad Weaver. It wasn't a force of me picked more than that, but we were allowed because they're pro players. Because <laughs> uh, they're very famous. So <laughs> um, Rashad Weaver, uh, Latavius Simmons, uh, Mason Kenzie, Julius Chestnut. Julius Chestnut has a serious golf game. Really? Oh, yeah. Huh. As a matter of fact, last week they organized, I think Will and um, Jeffrey Simmons organized a team trip to Top Golf. Julius Chestnut won the long drive. Yeah, I believe that. Serious golf game. Came huh. out in the whole, I mean, like a real golf suit. Yeah, I mean, suit? He was, not a suit. Well, like golf outfit. He had, Julius Chestnut had on a great looking golf outfit. I mean, phenomenal. His clubs were strong. I mean, you're like, whoa. And then, like, the game is there, too. Now, why am I surprised by this? I don't know. But I just thought it was awesome that he was – LaChavis Simmons was a good golfer, Can too. Can I ask a and question? And Mason Kenzie is a good golfer. Because I don't really Rashad know. Rashad is learning. He's going to be good. Interesting. Mm -hmm. If you bring your own clubs you, – Which you always do, Amy. Oh. 
Yeah, they're not provided for you. You bring your you own clubs. You have to bring your own clubs every time? You can't, like, rent them there? Well, not at a, no, no. So you bring your I own? I mean, cl- you can, but that's not really done. So it's not like bringing your own bowling ball? No, 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 no. Oh, so that's not no, like. people that bring their own bowling ball are very serious. Yeah. The people that bring their own clubs are very normal. So you ha- <laughs> you just have to have your own. You've got to have your own stick, clubs. same. Yeah. Huh. And I mean, he, I mean, it Did. was. Yeah. Impressive. I'm all, I, so if you're going to be a golfer, you, I mean, you've got to make a financial investment oh, in this. Oh, you do. Well, I was not a good golfer back when I could play. And so I, I always looked at people who were, and I was very impressed. Mm-hmm. Especially when, you like to say, when somebody's put together, yeah. like they have their outfit. And yeah. that's something the, you no say. No air quotes. It's a real thing. <laughs> <But> Outfits. <laughs> yeah. You, but you say but continue. this. Continue. Yes. But, I, I mean, he walks out and you're just like, oh. I mean, you knew when he got out of the car, you're like, oh, okay. Huh. Strong. All right. Did he have a hat? He did have a hat. Like a... No, no. Not like a golf hat? No. But he, like he, the little... He, he had a hat that totally matched what he was wearing. Like I a mean, Ricky Fowler flat right. bill kind of deal? No, no. But it, but, but it was... It was like... Uh, I think it was the same brand of hat as it was golf shirt. And it was like, oh, okay. Well, yeah, that's an outfit. Through and through. And then some guys show up and they're like, you know, my my friends were, which was just like jorts. <laughs> More or less. <laughs> muscle <Yeah>. shirts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were a little beyond Where muscle you? shirts. <laughs> Where are you golfing? <laughs> but, well, at Dead Horse Lake. Uh, I guess I only a, like At a public putt-putt. course yeah. where, where we used to play in. <laughs> Knoxville, my group. Stone was Cold Steve Austin showed yeah, up to play with us. That's, that's not wrong. All right. Uh, fourth down. <laughs> Who are you watching over the next week? I have two. Oh, you can't have two? Sure I can because they're, do, they're on two different adventures here. Everybody's trying to make the team, but my first one is Mason Kinsey. And Mason Kinsey is not just trying to make this team. He is making that 53. And he is trying hard. Like that, you can see in the way he plays and what he's doing. My man wants to make that 53. That is the way that he is playing. Broke his pinky. I know. But st- I mean, that, uh, do you think that is going to keep him from making the 53? Look at that pinky right there that was broken and had surgery. Rhett remembers this. I did it actually catching a football. Here, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. And yeah, you were casted up for a while. Well, they operated on it. I mean, it Is was... Is that really... It's yeah, like I've a got, big thing. It's a big thing because you don't you don't realize until you injure a pinky how... Sig- and I wasn't playing football after the fact, after the surgery or anything. But, I mean, I, I would guess his is not quite as messed up as that ended yeah, up being. doesn't sound like he needs surgery. But it's a big deal. Huh. It's a big deal because of... Of, of how you use it in terms of the the whole process. And I'll tell you this too, it hurts. Now that's an injury that if full disclosure, I completely blew over because I was like, oh, okay, I'm pinky. It's it'll, a thing. It's like Lou Groza with no toe. You didn't have a toe? No, he had a toe. It's like if you broke your t- big oh. toe. <laughs> well, and I mean, coach mentioning that <laughs> TK McClendon had turf toe come out of oh the Now, turf toe I know is bad. Well, wow. that's my wife made fun of my turf toe for years, and it was an injury that I had that was the most painful injury I ever had. It, it actually ended Jack Lambert's career as middle linebacker of the Pittsburgh Steelers. I, yeah. And, it, you know, there are things like that. You hear it, like Pinky, mm-hmm. and you think, mm. now I'm not saying it's going to keep him from making the team. No. But – if you're an offensive lineman, you could tape it together with your ring finger and you'd be fine. But I, he I don't needs know if it. You, yeah, I don't know if you can do that at wide receiver. So interesting it's to watch. Hit, it's got to put a hitch in his get along. It has yeah. to. Yeah, that's very interesting to watch. I really, I'm sorry, Mason Kinsey. I underestimated <laughs> what a pinky would mean. I, I, I really Mine did. still goes off through security sometimes. Well, wow. because you've got things in there. I know. Yeah, you you've got, got things in there. A hardware store in your pinky. I do. Oh, Who's I'm your sorry. other one well, you're I watching? Well, I want to give you my other one, though. <laughs> Look at Red. Thank you. Move along. Yeah. No, yeah, keep I mean, us on I'm, track. He, I'm he's, curious. He's no. like, move along. No. Because my, I'm curious. My other one. Max liked that. I looked at Max <laughs> behind the camera when he did. He's like that. My other one is David Martin Robinson. Tight mm. end. Mm-hmm. I am really interested to see how he continues to kind of make his case 
because I, I, I don't know. I don't know where he fits on this team. I haven't figured it out yet. I haven't uh, my brain and the roster math. I can't compute things the way that you can and the way you can Jimmy the numbers. I'm just watching the way that he has performed in practice, the way that he has performed in games, the way that he's made plays from time to time, the way that we've heard his number call. Mac was talking about him after the game last night about kind of the ways that he has continued to show his presence on the field. Um, So I am interested to see where he kind of establishes himself as this could be my role and I mean, are we able to find a spot for him, whether it's on the practice squad, whether it's on the 53, whether it's uh, wh- where where that could be? I don't know. But he's someone that I'm excited to watch in this final week of really making a case. Well, my, uh, Mike, when Mike and Mac and I were talking about him in post, post game, and Mike had the valid point, we talked about he didn't have a ton of numbers in the six years he was at Temple. His last season was his greatest season. And he had some injury woes. Like he had a bad year in 2021 with a got a collarbone and a foot. That's some broken. But the athleticism, truly there. A guy that big had a 35 and a half inch vertical leap at his pro day and a nine foot ten inch broad jump. Like yeah, his, you you love those guys because those are the players too that have the capability of being used as almost the fourth wide receiver in three wide receiver yes. sets with one tight end and. Yeah, and, and they did a little bit of that against Seattle where they split him out, and it was a bad matchup for a corner or a safety. And, yeah, he now he's not the biggest tight end. You know, no, he, no. He, he's do, he doesn't have those inline traits in terms of that 6'5", 255, 260 that you, that you just love. But, man. He, but to your point, though, lining him up like that, he was recruited at Temple – to mm-hmm. be a receiver, and then yeah. obviously he had a growth spurt or whatever, and was was moved to tight end. But yeah, interesting. David he's, Martin Robinson, he's pretty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your turn, Jalen Harrell. Okay, and it's just because when you look at the final stats, so two quarterback sacks, two tackles for loss, a forced fumble, but that's on eighteen snaps, Mike. Right, forty-one percent of the total defensive snaps. And that's what, I don't that's think, some good numbers, man. I don't know that he played – I think he played 12 snaps in the first game. Sounds right. So, I mean, they have used him judiciously. Some of the guys Saturday night played every snap. Yes. And, you know, they have used him judiciously. So, yeah, this is going to be a big week for him. 18 snaps, though. That's some – that's what you – just like we were talking about him earlier when he was your player of the game. In a rotational spot, boy, you'd take those numbers, wouldn't you? Sure. Good grief. For me, it's Devondre Sweat. It's the same mm-hmm. one it was last week. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Very pleased with what he did against Seattle. Very pleased with the week. He, he followed up two good weeks of work with another good week of work to the point that they chose not to play him in the preseason game because he had gotten enough done. And now he's got to continue to build on it again. Um I just, again, I'll say the Titans have never had anybody quite like this guy. He has had, I think, an outstanding camp to this point. I'm just looking forward to seeing more of him and having him be ready to go at Chicago by continuing to do what, you know, coaches have said for years, and that's stack days. And he has been stacking days like a pro. If he can get to Chicago – Here's here's a bit of news. They're not going to double team him because hmm. they have to double team Big Jeff. Or if they do choose to double team Tavondre, they can't double team Big Jeff. Yeah. Good luck. Good luck, Caleb. <laughs> um, you, you know, but but Tavondre's got to conti- It can't just be on potential. It can't just be on us being excited. It's having put the work in, getting there, and then being ready to execute that in the game in the season opener at Chicago. I get what you're saying. It's it's the reason you're watching him finish strong because he right. did not play against Seattle. Right. And knowing that there's light at the end of the tunnel, meaning the end of camp and a final preseason game before cuts, continue to do the work you've done. Well, and continue to do good work. Right. I, I mean, all reports on him are, are really solid for what he's doing off the field. Uh, the guys are complimentary of him in the defensive line room. And – I mean, would we necessarily hear if he wasn't doing well? No, we would hear nothing 
probably, but when you hear guys bragging about him, when you hear Jeff uh, bragging about him, and and Sebastian Joseph Day was in the the Bet MGM studio with Amy and me, and and bragged about, hey, Tavondre's doing great, and the coaching staff's very pleased with him. I mean, they need him to be a difference maker. They don't just need him to be one of the eleven or one of the forty-eight or whatever. We're not talking about a Jalen Harrell role. We're talking about greater we're, than that. We're talking about something that can take the front of the defense and make it totally different because of the physical gifts that he brings. And listen, I'm not penning the whole defense on him. I'm just saying if you're going to be the best you can be, they need him to be the best he can be as a rookie. And he'll grow and learn. He'll have bad games and good games. But the way you do it is putting in the work. And so far, no days off, no, you know, all all of those sorts of things are going well. And, you know, I'm just excited to see him play Chicago. You know, I'm excited to see that opportunity based on what I've seen so far and what I hope we continue to see over the next week and the next three weeks. Crazy? No. Not crazy. Not at all. Crazy. Because you you hit the nail on the head there a minute ago because of how you can attack certain quarterbacks, the elite ones. If you can – cave in the middle of that pocket and rush four and let the, the back two-thirds do what they can do. Again, that's how you beat Patrick Mahomes. That's how you beat Lamar Jackson. That's how you beat any quarterback. I mean – Because if you're getting pressure up the middle, there there is no quarterback who has ever lived who has been their best with pressure coming up the middle from a – You're st- getting a guard dumped from a, back in your – Exactly. Wow. Because there is – there's nowhere to step up. Maybe you can step out or roll out, but your timing's off, your vision's off. Obviously, too, just as a human being, if you've got a gargantuan human coming at you (laughs) and you're standing still, I mean, that's not good. No. Uncomfortable. Right. A lot of times when you overly blitz young quarterbacks, you help them because the decisions for them become automatic. When they see blitz – They know what they're going to do. They don't have to think about it. When it is a standard rush and it's just somebody coming up the gut, you know, we saw this for years with Jarrell Casey with what he did, with Albert Hainsworth, you know, with uh, Josh Evans and uh, Henry Ford and some of the other defensive tackles we've had. When we've been really good and you've had people on the – and with Jeff, when when you have people on the interior who can get pressure – it is a, or or help their teammates on the interior get pressure. I, I mean, that's there's no answer for that for a quarterback. There, yep. When you've got somebody in your lap, there is no answer for that. And this guy, I, I mean, I mean, that's the whole deal, Amy. It, you've got one monster. Oh, if yeah. you've got another. Well, well, yeah. And I mean, what does it do for Joseph Day? And what does it do for Landry? And what does it do for Key? And what does it do for Harrell when he's in the game? Or, you know, Murray, um, Adams blitzing from safety Mm -hmm. or Diggs blitzing from safety. Um, I mean, it's a totally different world. Yeah. The whole defense changes with those two guys. Rhett, do you have any final comments? Anything else you'd like to say about the Tennessee Titans before we let you go? No, I just I'm I'm looking forward to, you know, the last few days of camp and obviously going to New Orleans and seeing, uh, you know, to your your surprise of the four downs, you know, the starters having an integral part in that and, you know, getting ready to wrap that part up and. Here we go to Chicago. I'm I'm excited about where everything is right. And we're now. on the air Sunday at noon central. Right. That's for everybody listening to Titans Radio. Noon Central kickoff is at one central, a little hour later than what we're normally doing on a Sunday noon kick. And so. Sunday, not Saturday. Last two have been Saturday. This one's on Sunday. That's right. Because apparently the Saints got backed up somewhere and so they could not play on Saturday for some reason. Everybody wanted to play on Saturday, but they couldn't. They didn't go marching in. Nope. Wow. Saints play on Sunday. It makes a lot of sense. Okay. So God's day. Titans, Saints, next Sunday, 1 o'clock Central, Titans countdown on the air at noon. For Rhett Bryan and Amy Wells, and for the four downs, I'm Mike Keith. Thanking you for joining us once again for the OTP4.
D. 